and all the ways of men. You were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known. treasures of the earth. There's no way to measure what you're worth. Crucified, lay behind the stone. You live to die, rejected and alone. Like a rose trampled on the ground, you took the fall and all of me hovered.
took the fall. You took the fall. I thought about you. Come on. I thought of me. For the reading of God's word, our Old Testament scripture is found in Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 6 of the King James Version. Who have believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He have no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, and our New Testament scripture will be found in 1 Peter at the 18, verse through 20, and then 1 Peter 2, verses 20 through 25. And it reads, for as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation by tradition of your fathers, but with precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish or without spot, who verily was for ordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. And then Chapter 2, verses 20 through 25, it reads, For what glory is it if when ye were buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even there hereunto where ye call, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when we he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to that judge righteously. Who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were like sheep gone astray you were like sheep gone astray but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls this is the word of the Lord let us pray real quickly father God we thank you Lord we thank you on today for the fact that you died for us Lord God we did not deserve the punishment that you took onto yourself Lord God you said that no man take your life, but you lay it down. So we're grateful for the fact, Lord Jesus, that you remain submitted from your first to your last breath, Lord God, and that you decided to take all of our pains, our sufferings to the cross. 
Lord, you endured every scar. You endured every lash. You endured every nail for our sake, Lord Jesus. And we just want to say thank you. Lord God, we thank you on today. We wonder what the psalm said, Lord God. What is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him? But you have made us lower than the angels, but you have crowned us with glory and honor. So, Lord God, on this Friday morning or evening, Lord God, we just want to say thank you. Our thank you is never enough, Lord God, but we just want to do it, Lord God. We want to do it with the clapping of our hands, with the raising of our voices, Lord God, with a shout of hallelujah to let you know that we love you, to let you know, Lord God, that we appreciate you, Lord, to let you know that in spite of everything that we may experience, that you went through it and that you did it for our behalf. So so Lord God, we do this on today, Lord God. We receive every saying that you say. And Lord God, we ask that you will bless this service in Jesus' name. Amen.
Give him glory. Give him honor. Come on, lift him up. Hallelujah. 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 His name is Jesus. Hallelujah. You may be seated. What a wonderful, glorious, but somber time that we are able to share together this afternoon. What a blessing it is to come into a place that has been sanctified to his name, a people who have been redeemed by his blood, who really begin to appreciate the awesome power and love of God that was demonstrated some 2,000 years ago, but for me it's fresh every day. Yeah, this week, as all weeks in our lives are blessing, but this week in particular, as we have tried to walk with the Lord, to the hundreds and thousands who have joined us even today, many of you by way, again, of technology are with us. Give the Lord praise and welcome those who are here by way of technology. Come on, make some noise for them. We do appreciate and thank and praise the Lord for you walking with us and uh, in this day and time when so many things are happening that are simply beyond comprehension. Never have we lived in a day and time when chaos has been so pervasive. Never have we lived in a day and time when deception is so pervasive. Never have we lived in a day and time when even the people who gather in his name have been tainted by the deception of the enemy. The Apostle Paul says if it were possible he would fool even the very elect. But we are on guard for him today. We stand guard with him today. We profess without shame the deep love we have for the Lord. And we gather today because of him and him alone. So one more time, give him praise. Yeah. Give him your best praise. Give him your most profound, deepest praise. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hosanna in the highest. Hallelujah. 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 Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died at Calvary. Mercy there was great, grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me. It was there my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Oh, the blood that bought salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, oh the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. The somber tombs of Calvary must dominate your spirit. You cannot appreciate resurrection morning if you don't drink deeply from Friday's sacrifice. I've been asked to share tonight at St. Sabina and they gave me a text that I haven't preached much about. And I've been thinking the last few days about every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. John says in that, in that issue about Jesus that he spoke these words from the cross. 
And I wonder, we've been saved so long that we are no longer affected by his word. His words on Calvary change the entire panorama of life. You cannot get too deep when you talk about what happened at Golgotha. You cannot become so used to it that you're not broken by it. He died for your sins. He died for your sins. He died for your sins. Don't blame anyone else. He died for my sins. He died in my place. He willingly laid down his life for me. I owe him everything, all the time, every day. People say, you're too emotional. You're never emotional. You don't get it. You've been hoodwinked. You've been bamboozled. You run amok. You must embrace the passion of the Lord. And so this afternoon, we gather to remember, to reflect, to rejoice, and yes, even to repent. In the chapel, there's a cross where thousands of prayer requests have been nailed to that cross. And I've tried to, every day I've come to spend some time in that room. And I feel the depth of people who need God and believe that God is able and I understand what a privilege we have to take every cross, every request to the cross and actually pray for those people and believe with them that this God who came in human flesh cares for them. And that's why we come. And that's why we're here. And that's why we prepare to one more time be in his presence at the foot of the cross. The word of the Lord gives us clear direction about this as we hear these seven last sayings. But it didn't start with the first word on the cross. It began early in the morning when they, they scourged him. We have become sensitive to the need of our young people. I know years ago, some of the leaders said to me, you know, we do these Good Friday services, but there's a problem when we depict these soldiers beating Jesus, and it frightens some of our children. I'm not so sure that was an accurate report. Maybe it frightened them. Maybe we are afraid to feel the pain. Maybe we are afraid to acknowledge the cost. We watch murder on TV every day. Our kids are on the videos all the time. We don't stop that. But I believe that the enemy wants us not to appreciate what happened at Calvary. We should do what Paul says. I know I'm not the preacher, but I read this this morning in my devotion. When Paul writes to the church, he says, I have determined to know nothing among you. With all of his accolades of intellectualism, I have determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He's explicit about it. It is the crucifixion that is the core of grace. It cost him everything. We owe him everything. We owe him everything. And so they beat him for hours. They laughed at him. They undressed him. They put a crown of thorns on his head. And they nailed him to a tree. It was the ignominious lynching of Jesus that allowed the sun at noontime to hide his face. 
So this afternoon, we will spend some time hearing the words of our Lord in the midst of his death on a cross called Calvary. The Bible is very clear about the first word. The word of God is clear about it because it is Luke that speaks about it. The Bible says in the 23rd chapter, in the 34th verse, then said Jesus, Father, 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 forgive them, for they know not what they do, and they parted his raiment and cast lots. Mr. Joseph McGee. The first of Jesus' last saying shows the orientation of his heart and exemplifies the posture we must have as his disciples. To paint the scene, the Lord has been betrayed, arrested, beaten beyond recognition, and sentenced to death by the cross in an unfair trial. While experiencing asphyxiation, Jesus pulls himself up on his already marred and wounded back to utter, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Through this excruciating execution, Jesus made it a point to pray. A prayer not for himself that his suffering might cease, nor against his enemies that they be stopped, but he prayed for us, for us to be forgiven and for us to learn how to forgive. This prayer may be short, but it's powerful and timeless. It's echoed throughout generations as a point of reference for us to know that no matter what transgressions we make against God, Jesus forgave us and prayed that we may be covered by his shed blood. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. And we must know that each of us, whether we're gathered together in the sanctuary or for those of us who are connected in the e-church, all of us represent them in Christ's prayer. For Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means that none of us are worthy, but Jesus extends forgiveness for all those who have yet to gain the faith and for those of us who have heard his voice and hardened not our hearts. Because of Jesus' selfless sacrifice, we are covered by the blood, which signifies forgiveness. And that blood and that forgiveness, my brothers and sisters, comes with responsibility. Because we've been forgiven by the blood, we must forgive because of the blood. Amen. And now, now we can all be honest and admit that, that there are times we're almost proud to hold a grudge when we've been wrong. Whether it's that family member or a close friend who disappointed us, or, or maybe it's those of you in the Eat Church and you were loyal to that company or that job and, and they just did you wrong for no reason. Or maybe it's some of us that carry around that church shirt and we just wear it like a badge of honor. We oftentimes feel justified standing in unforgiveness. But, but can I tell you something? We, we can't get too prideful when people do us wrong because Jesus was able to forgive while he was being crucified for sin that was not his own. He took our place and hung on a cross that we could be forgiven and it was our sins who put him there in the first place for he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities the, the chastisement of peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed for years we spent in vanity and pride caring not our Lord was crucified knowing not it was for us he died at Calvary Paul writes in Ephesians and Colossians, forgive one another as Christ has forgiven you. Jesus said in Matthew 4, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Brothers and sisters, that means we have the charge to forgive one another as Christ has forgiven us. Jesus died that all could be reconciled with the Father, and he did it with you and I in mind, and he did it out of love. 
undeservingly. He prayed for us that we might be forgiven. And in the midst, he taught us how to forgive and expects us to do just that. You may have been done wrong today, yesterday, or and we could all be done wrong tomorrow. But can I tell you something? We've been forgiven by a God who was the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. That means our assignment is to forgive quickly and to forgive with the love of Christ. Father, forgive us, for we know not what we do. Glory. Hallelujah. 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 Father, forgive them. Forgive us. For we know not what we do. Woo. Hallelujah. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. The Bible said there were two others who were hung with him. They were male factors and they railed against him saying, one of them, if you be the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other one answering rebuked his friend saying, don't you fear God? See, we're in this same condemnation. We are here justly, for we're receiving the due reward of our deeds. How did he say this? But this man had done nothing amiss. And he turns to Jesus and says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And the Bible says, Jesus stopped dying. <laughs> he literally, physiologically, psychologically, emotionally stopped dying and said to this man, today, today shall thou be with me in paradise, Chloe Gillespie Gogans. So when I think of this scripture and the tragic scene that set Jesus on the cross next to his actually guilty counterparts. It's easy to immediately gravitate to the promise of paradise as the only shining light at the end of this verse. I mean, this exchange is occurring between a beaten, bloodied, and innocent Jesus and a beaten, bloodied, and guilty criminal. It's redemptive, yes, but still so tragic in all that I, as the reader, want for the both of them is immediate relief from their discomfort. All I want is this coming paradise that Jesus speaks of. Because surely, all that this moment is, is suffering. So it becomes easy in my or our humanity to think that that's the solution of the scripture, the promise of paradise. Revelations 21, 18 through 19 describes paradise as we know it. It talks about how the walls of heaven were, quote, made of jasper and the city of pure gold. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone and how the streets were, quote, gold, as pure as transparent glass. Revelations 21 and 4 also describes paradise as a place where God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. Now, scripturally, paradise can be understood simply as a place for those who love, enjoy, and choose Jesus. But colloquially and theoretically, I'm afraid we understand it differently. We believe that paradise is only the absence of tears in golden streets. We believe that paradise is all about feeling good and being surrounded by good circumstances and good people, right? Even when describing our dream getaways, what makes it paradise are our best dreamt up ideal circumstances. But saints, if this is our singular understanding woo, of the true promise of paradise, we are woefully mistaken. Rereading the scripture, maybe the good part, doesn't start with paradise. Maybe it starts when Jesus says, thou will be with me. Mm. I'd like to argue that for the criminal, 
Paradise was accessed at that very moment, hanging on a cross. I'd argue that despite his situation, when the, criminal, when the criminal realized who Jesus was, I mean, truly saw him, he experienced a sort of paradise. No, not the streets of gold and jasper, but something different, something deeper. Now, one may say, how is that possible? The criminal was experiencing one of the most shameful type of deaths of the sixth century. One could assume that he hung there ashamed, depressed, discouraged, maybe even angry at the jeering from the crowds. Because surely we can't know paradise when we don't feel good. Or maybe you could say, well, he was in excruciating pain. He was literally suffocating to death, which is the intention of any crucifixion. Surely we can't know paradise when our bodies aren't well. Paradise can't exist when we're weak, wilted, ill, or exhausted. But I'd like to argue again that paradise is simply wherever Jesus is. Hallelujah. It is wherever Jesus is. And we access it when we see him and submit. And so like the criminal who found paradise on a cross, so too can we find paradise in every circumstance. If we are with Jesus, paradise can be found in pulpits and prisons. If we are with Jesus, paradise can be found in broken homes and funeral homes. If we are with Jesus, paradise can be found in war-torn countries, nursing homes, mental institutions, and hospital rooms, whether it be across states, or across countries within our e-church. Where Jesus is, paradise can be found. With Jesus, our circumstances fail to determine a thing. And like the criminal, we don't gotta wait for paradise. We can experience it like that. We can have it when we recognize the Savior right beside us. So the message is simple. If you find Christ, you found paradise. found paradise, giving praise and glory and honor. Hallelujah is right. Hallelujah. We have found paradise. And it's with Jesus. Who, who are these young people? Where did where, where they, where they come from? Now scaring me. I see a future, y'all. I see some. <laughs> hey, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a word, what a word, what a word. Now listen. Jesus is on the cross and the thieves are next to him. There are some other people there as well. The Bible says, according to John's gospel, there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. Courageous women at the foot of the cross. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, he said unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then said he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her into his own home. Minister Durrell Peacock. Mary was a young, betrothed virgin, rurally poor, from no great family, yet she was a devoted Jew who knew the law, she knew scriptures. The Bible says that she and Joseph made a pilgrimage to, for the Passover every year. Men did that, not women. In Luke 1, the angel Gabriel blows her mind and changes the trajectory of her life yeah. with hail. Thou art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. Yeah. He goes on to tell her how, by whom, and why she was chosen to bring the Messiah into the world. 
And what does she do? She swallows her pride. She swallows her fear. Yeah. She denies the imposter syndrome that definitely afflicts everybody. Oh. And she declares these words, behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Mary, first, Mary was the first disciple of Jesus. Her commitment to the cause and call of Jesus is a glaring example of obedient yeah. faith. Hey. Regardless of the situation, Regardless of the circumstance, from losing Jesus in the temple at 12 to the verbal exchange that they, she had with him that came to the marriage, the wedding in Galilee, to my assignment today. Picture it, Jerusalem, 8033, on a hill of skulls called Golgotha. It's dark, ominous, even noon, pitch black. Luke 23, 44 says the sun's light failed. Yet, Mary stands with friends at the foot of the cross, watching the Messiah, her son of promise, yes. slaughtered on a tree, a gruesome death that her child does not deserve. This woman, familiar with loss, familiar with lack, stood. Through pain, injustice, darkness, grief, she stood. But then when Jesus saw her, through bleary eyes, unimaginable and excruciating agony, he saw her standing, justified, disciplined, aware of her assignment, standing. Throughout the Gospels, we read so many things transpired so that the scriptures could be fulfilled. My interpretation of Jesus' pre-crucifixion -pre itinerary, it was packed. He had many things to do but Mary made the list. He made plans for her in spite of her circumstances. It was a covenant, a promise. Yeah. So for us, Hebrews 13:5, he'll never leave us, he'll never forsake us. Yeah. Never leave, never forsake. The Bible says that Jesus saw his mother and disciples that he loved and consider, but y'all consider this, consider the trust that Jesus had for John that he said to him, also, can Jesus trust you with his stuff? Can Jesus trust you with his cherished stuff? The phenomenal thing for me that John did not consider it. He didn't have to mull it over. He didn't pray about it. He took her. The Bible says in verse 27, from that hour, he took her until his home. That was it. It's a reminder that God does not abandon those people he calls in their time of need, but he often responds by encircling them in the arms of others that he's called. All right? Woman, behold, don't miss this one. Not leaving you without a covering. Although Mary had other children, they were not disciples, uh -oh. meaning they had no discipline. They hadn't chosen to follow Jesus. Yeah. So think about it. Jesus considered Mary's spiritual and natural, and he was hungry. Yeah. Chloe just told you. Hung, dying, couldn't breathe, but he thought about her. She was made the list. So, brothers and sisters, we can't focus on our lack. When Jesus is saying, behold, we cannot dwell where we are from or what accomplishes may or may not exist. Yeah. Behold. Behold the covering he's established, y'all. Behold the way he made. Behold, don't miss the new relationship he formed. Ignore the darkness, the elevation of the problems. Ignore the pain. Ignore the discomfort. Ignore your habits. Ignore the distractions. Woman, behold thy son. Hallelujah. Come on, give him real praise. Give him a praise of appreciation. How in his death does he have the discipline and the love to put things in order? Something about Jesus on that cross as I shared tonight at St. Sabina, I thought about what we miss often. 
is a profound love that he had for us. He demonstrates to us how to put things in order, and yet at the same time, he ignores his own need. This Lamb of God has been on the cross for hours. We have heard his voice. We have seen his greatness. But then the scene shifts. He has spoken to the Lord about others. And now he demonstrates not his divinity, but his humanity. We speak as apostolics of the greatness of God's divinity. We often miss the lesson. The love of, of God is shown not in his divinity, but in his humanness. It is easy for a God to do great things. But what about a person? And the Bible depicts it in a way that is the Greek word mysterion. He speaks now for the first time of his own self, and he speaks it in a time that it should be the brightest of the day. At noon, from the sixth hour, there was darkness over the entire land for three hours. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabbatana, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Minister Paulette Holmes. He crieth out, as the Lamb of God, Jesus bears the burden of the sins of the world. He feels the weight of the sins of every person on the earth. Those in the present moment, those who had already died, and those who are to come, which would be us. He felt the weight of the burden of sin. From the weight of it, he cried from his humanity. The agony, the torture and suffering from sins. Jesus bore our sins so we would not have to experience the judgment or death from it. Yes, that's the spirit by which he cried. To emphasize, he cried as he bore the sins of our iniquities placed upon him. An excerpt from Isaiah says, he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Jesus bore our iniquities. Jesus bore our shame. Yeah. It was when the sins of the world was placed upon him, he cried out. Let me put it this way. He who knew no sin uh -huh. now has the weight of the government, now has the weight of the sins of the world placed upon him. Sin is a weight. Yeah. The weight of the world of the sins was placed upon him. He who knew no sin, Jesus knew no sins, yet he bears that which he does not know. Jesus bears sin he does not know so that he can be touched, glory, with the feelings of our infirmities. He is now connected to how we feel. He feels your struggles. He feels your pain. He feels your grief. Remember, when the sins of the world were placed upon
upon him. He who knew no sins bears that which he does not know and in desperation he crieth out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why are you so far from me? In that moment, when the burden of sin was placed upon him, it separated him from his father. Now the separation made him cry it out. It's in that cry when Jesus realized, I can't live apart from him. Brothers and sisters in the G church and those under the sound of my voice, I don't know about you, but I need God. It's personal for me. For in him I live, in him I move, in him I have my being. If God don't supply my next breath, I can't breathe without him. If God don't speak to my nervous system, I can't move. I'm, 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 I can't move without him. If God don't touch my vocal cords, I can't I can't speak without him. When you realize you are separated from God, it should make you cry out by day and by night. Oh God, I need you. Whatever you do, don't take your spirit from me. <laughs> Hallelujah. How blessed we are without and beyond measure that somebody loved us enough to take our place. The story of Jesus cannot be contained in the earth. The Bible says, important to John, that if all the deeds that he did had ever been recorded, the world would not be large enough to hold the library. He loved with a deep love, he loved with an unwavering love, he loved with a love that would not stop, even though those that he died for did not appreciate him. He has cried for the first time, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But he is strengthened by divine purpose. I must be careful because I'm tempted tonight to talk to all of us apostolics and Trinitarians and tell us, stop fighting about something you have no idea about. You have no idea about the person of Jesus. You cannot fathom him at Gethsemane. You cannot tell me with any rationality what happened in the Jordan. You cannot do that. The human mind cannot contain the wonder of who he really is. He is Alpha and he is Omega. He is beginning and he is ending. He's first and he's last. He's human, he's divine. He's the Son and the Father and the Holy Spirit. He's all of that. He is Jesus. The deliverer, the rescuer, the redeemer, the lover of our souls, the one that if it had not been for the Lord on our side, we would not be here today. Give him one more praise because he's worthy. Hallelujah. And the Bible says, who hallelujah. <laughs> In John chapter 19, 
after this, after crying out to God and knowing that purpose, all things were now accomplished so that the scripture might be fulfilled, so that the word of God might be manifested. He said, I thirst, Minister Amy Baldwin. You're fine. I ask myself, why is it necessary for John to capture, highlight this pivotal moment during the crucifixion of Jesus Christ? Why is Jesus thirsty? Is not this the same Jesus who told the woman at the well, whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be a well of water springing up of everlasting life? Why is Jesus thirsty? The text, I thirst, alludes to both a literal and a figurative meaning. In the traditional sense of the word, the literal meaning thirsty can be triggered by the body's loss of critical fluids. For example, excessive, excessive blood loss can trigger the thirst mechanism within the body, signifying a need for replenishment. In addition, thirst is unique in that it demands the critical substance, whatever that it was lost, in order to satisfy and quench the thirst. In other words, when the body loses water, the body requires water. Or when the body loses blood, it requires blood. Substitutions are not an option, and imitations just can't satisfy. So why is Jesus thirsty? Consider our walk with Jesus. We walked with him into the Garden of Gethsemane, where he agonized over the suffering that was to come. And he went a little further, the scripture says, and he fell on his face and he prayed, saying, oh, for my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but thy will. The cup that Jesus is referencing is the cup of redemption. The only redeemer in the Hebrew is the king's men redeemer. And that kingdom redeemer is the one who must pay the price for the king's king's men. Our redemption required a whole lot of blood. As our near kinsman, he, as our redeemer, he re was required to pour out a lot of blood. Why is Jesus thirsty? For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it unto you upon the altar to make an atonement for the soul for it is the blood it is the blood that make an atonement for the soul why is Jesus thirsty our redemption required so much blood that from the moment they captured him and led him away indicted him on unwarranted charges when they mocked him and they scourged him blood became began to flow out from his body out of the exit wounds into the cup of redemption and as he walked from Gathel's hill up that incline towards Calvary every heartbeat forced blood out of his body every heartbeat force blood into the cup of redemption for you and for you and for you and for me every step of the way 
blood came out for our redemption. And the text says, after this, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus says, I thirst. They gave me gall for my meat. And in my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. For Christ also who once suffered for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. He's thirsty because he wanted to bring us to God he's thirsty because he wanted to lead us to God and in the vernacular thirsty it can denote a signify a level of desperation for example one who demands who's who is thirsty in the modern day we may say he may be desperate to desire the detention of another. The desperation becomes the determinate factor which derives a person's and it drives the person's actions to the others. It, that action may seem unreasonable or unnecessary, but to the one who's controlled by that desperation, <laughs> the resistance is fueled out. Why is Jesus thirsty? Jesus is so thirsty to bring us into reconciliation that he offered his head whew, with a crown of thorns. He offered his back for the healing of the nations. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened up his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep to the seers. He was dumb. He opened up his mouth. He was taken from prison to prison to judgment to judgment. Who shall declare in his generation? He was cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people. Was my God, Jesus, was stricken? He's thirsty because of the wicked. He's thirsty because of the lawless. He's thirsty because of the unforgiving. <sighs> Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He was put to grief. Thou shalt make thy soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. And he shall belong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. He shall see the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall his righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear our iniquities. And after this, Jesus, knowing that all things are now accomplished, that the scripture shall be fulfilled, I thirst. Yeah. Hallelujah! I thirst. I thirst. I don't know if you can appreciate the depth of that word, what it means to be thirsty, <laughs> what drives you to do things that you would not ordinarily do when you're thirsty, the quench and the prophetic word in Isaiah that he shall see the manifestation of his sacrifice. 
in the lives of those that he has come to redeem. He's been on the cross almost six hours, and John goes a little bit further. He says, now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge. He's the only one, John records this, with vinegar and put it upon hyssop, a plant, and put it on his mouth. And when Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. He didn't say he was finished. It is finished, and he gave up the ghost. Minister Anthony Reed Collier. Give God praise as you come. Jesus knew from the beginning that his time on earth wouldn't be long. He knew his death was imminent. He speak his last few words before he gave up the ghost. It is finished. Meaning he paid the price for our sins in full. The work of Jesus' earthly ministry has come to an end, but be carried out through all the believers through his spirit. He came not to do his own will, but the will of the Father that sent him. Jesus' ministry on earth was full of life. He manifests himself so, in so many ways, proving that he was indeed the son of the living God. Signs of miracles and wonders he had performed and how he taught with power and authority. Now he has manifest himself as the Lamb of God for our sins to come to take away our sins from the earth. Yep. Romans 5 and 12 declares, Wherefore as by one man's sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all, for all have sinned. Therefore all have sinned and come short of God's glory. So the sacrifice, sacrificial system and the law also came up short. The sacrifice of animals was not enough to redeem us back to God. It only appeased the wrath of God. Hebrews 10 and 5 says, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not, but, body, but a body as thou hast prepared me. Yeah. So therefore Jesus was born to die. His death had purpose and his death had so much meaning. Therefore his death was not in vain. His death was hopeful or hopeless. His death means that we can have peace and joy. His death means that we can be reconciled back to God. His death means that there be life for us. So the word of God declares, you have healed quickened that were dead in trespasses and in sins. So his death brought us life and life abundant. It also meant we, came, we can come now boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. We now live in a society that seems like death has no meaning at all. It seems like we have forgotten what Jesus has done for us at Calvary. It appears that the love and the fear of God is just slowly slipping away. Hatred and murder, road rage, disrespect to parents, armed robberies, carjacking, senseless crimes, attacks on our children and the elderly. As believers, we cannot let the death of Jesus on the cross be in vain. We must give him glory that he deserves. In 1 Corinthians 6 and 20, it declares that we have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Yes, we should have a lift that is pleasing to God, a life of holiness, a life that would bring him glory and honor. So you that are in the sanctuary, or you that are streaming online, and as for those who have think that God has forgotten about you, you probably wonder why he had to die such a horrific death, why he had to, he had to die for such a worm as you and I. What do you see in us? But I tell you why. It proved that God loved. It proved that God loved us so much that the Bible says his game is only begotten son. That's who will believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Hallelujah. So Jesus told us in John 10 and 10, the thief coming out to steal, to steal, kill, and destroy. But I come that you might have life and that more abundantly. So this is the reason why, amen, that we must lift up Jesus every chance that we get. Amen. We must remind the world that Jesus did die for us. In John 12 and 32, Jesus said, And if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Just lift me up where everybody can see me. Hallelujah. 
This is the time that we need to lift God up like never before. Uh, the world has gone crazy. Uh, they forgot what Jesus has done for them. Uh, hallelujah. Uh, but us as believers, uh, we must not let Jesus' death be in vain. Uh, hallelujah. Uh, we must spread the gospel uh, everywhere that we go. Uh, hallelujah. Uh, he didn't have to do what he did uh, because he loves us so much. Uh, he was willing to die. Uh, he was willing to suffer uh, a horrific death. Uh, hallelujah. Uh, so don't give up. Uh, don't throw in the towel. Uh, hallelujah. Uh, don't stop praying. Uh, hallelujah. Uh, don't stop coming to church. Uh, hallelujah. Uh, I don't care who don't come, uh, but you ought to come. Uh, hallelujah. Uh, Jesus had done so much for us. Uh, we can't tell it all. Uh, hallelujah. Uh, he paid the ultimate sacrifice. Uh, hallelujah. Uh, he shed his blood. Uh, he died for our sins. Uh, hallelujah. Uh, the work of salvation. Uh, it is finished. God bless you. Woo! Hallelujah. Glory. Glory. It's finished. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo. What a mighty God we serve. Hallelujah. Uh, Feel like shouting, feel like giving God the praise. Sing it! <laughs> Hallelujah. What he's done for us is literally indescribable. You cannot overestimate the power, the consistency of his love. Hallelujah. Jesus, our perfect example. Jesus, as one of the speakers said, our kinsman redeemer. You ought to do a study of that. You look, look at what, what happened with Ruth and Naomi. Look at Boaz. And we talk about a woman getting a husband. I got my Boaz. You don't even know what you're talking about. You don't know what, who Boaz is. Boaz is Jesus, your kinsman redeemer. He's the one that when nobody else wants you, he loves you. You gotta understand this. Y'all make me do this, y'all. Oh, oh, oh! Get excited about the redeemer. Hallelujah. Woo. After all of this, it was about the sixth hour. Darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour when the sun was darkened. You've heard it. The veil of the temple was rent in the midst. The veil of the temple where we were in Jerusalem and we saw it where the place that separated the holy place from the holy of holies that only once a year the high priest alone could go behind the veil. But when Jesus died, the veil was rent. The access to God was open because of the blood that was shed. And the Bible says it was rent in the midst. And when Jesus cried with a loud voice, he simply said, Father, Father, to thy hands I commend my spirit. Having said thus, he gave up the ghost, Elder Dale Hopkinson. Sent by God, having lived among men, now numbered and dying among the transgressors, Jesus remains focused on his call to fulfill scripture and his lifestyle of commitment to God. Having overcome his private struggle by choosing humility, obedience, submission, and servanthood, 
Jesus now hangs on the cross, dying in public humiliation. But the perpetual victory of sin, death, and the grave is near. Sensing this pending victory, Jesus triumphantly gives us one last example of submitting to the lordship of the sovereign king. He proudly proclaims the prayer found in Psalm 31.5 and dies with scripture in his mouth. Jesus died the way he lived in communication with and total commitment to the Father in heaven. Uh -huh. Doing so, Jesus shows us a principle. Completing what God has commanded of you requires you to commit your life to him. Committed, completing what God has commanded or called you to do requires that you commit your life to him. After the cross, Jesus is going to a place to perform ministry, a different ministry. Jesus must go preach to the captives and retrieve the keys of death and the grave. Now he's going to a place he's not gone before. And he's doing a work he's not done yet. But fulfilling this call that God has required of him, he needs to trust the Father completely. Yeah. We know Jesus was the one who said, no man takes my life. I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down. And I have the power to pick it back up again. This is the command my father gave to me. But Jesus must commit or entrust his life to someone trustworthy uh, since he was coming back to retrieve it. By putting it into God's hands, Jesus transfers the responsibility of his life to the care of someone else. Uh, the hands and care of the Father. Yes. Trusting the Father in death, Jesus shows us how to trust the Father in life. Oh. If the Father was trustworthy enough for Jesus, Why are you still trying to control your life? Jesus' commitment to the cross restores the relationship with the Heavenly Father and allows us access to draw near to Him. The veil of the temple is ripped, is rent. And now there's only one sacrifice that God is really interested in. And you and I, brothers and sisters, must complete this commitment. God is eagerly waiting for you to take your life out of your hands and to put it into his hands. Now against the backdrop, my assignment. God wants you to live out every command on your life. I've come to speak to some people in this season. You feel stuck. You feel frustrated. The problem is not in the situation. The problem is in you trying to figure it out. The problem is not in the situation. The problem is you trying to strategize the way. But Jesus said you don't have to figure out the way. You don't have to design the way. Just look at me because I am. I like this church. Y'all know the Bible. Can I tell you what he showed me in my study? Next level ministry will require next level submission, AFC. Next level ministry requires next level submission. 
you must submit to the lordship of Christ. God wants a Calvary-like commitment. A commitment when you get to the point and you say, if I die, I die. <laughs> but my life is in his hands. <laughs> if I die, I die. <laughs> but God, you are in charge of this vessel. Anyone want to live a greater purpose? Your life must be in his hands. If you've been called to go where you've never gone before and to do what you've never done before, you've got to submit like never before. You've got to submit and put it into his hands. But there's a piece of this text I want to explore with you. The scripture says, he cried out with a loud voice. The last time we see Jesus in a loud voice, there was a voice of desperation. He felt separated from his father. But now there's no more desperation. There's no more abandonment. There's a feeling, a sense, a, a tingling in his shadow that victory is near. But I know that victory belongs to the Lord. I can't go to this battle by myself. So I've got to call Father. I've got to call him. I've learned in preparation that the Father is attracted to sound. That's why the Bible tells us he dwells in the praises of his people. We can read in Exodus when the cry of the children of Israel came up before him. He was attracted to the sound. So when he heard his son called Father, there was a response by the Father. Have you ever called your father? Don't your father come running when you have a need? Doesn't your father come running? I've learned, brothers and sisters, when you submit the most powerful words in the dictionaries are help me. Help me summons resources. Help me attracts help. Help me when you're humble enough to say help me. The Father will come to deliver you. Jesus gives us the example. He shows us in David. Psalm 37, 5. Commit your way unto the Lord. Trust also in him. And he shall bring it to pass. So, Proverbs 16, 3. Solomon. Commit your works to the Lord. And your plans will be established. Revelation from Paul. Paul said, For I know in whom I have believed. And even in my struggle, even in my stress, even in my persecution, I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Can I ask you a question? If he was able for Solomon and he was able for David and we see he was able for Jesus and he was able for Paul is my God not able for you can I can you do me a favor when I ask you if he's able just call out father you got it when I ask if he's able with a loud Victorious voice just called Father, you ready? In the able. In the able. There's a sound of victory in the able. He was able for Jesus. In the able. In the able. Now, when you call it, commit to it.
Come on, give him praise. Give him a loud praise. Wherever you are in virtual church, give him a high praise wherever you are. In your car, in your house, give him praise on your job. Give him praise. Woo! Wow. That's the word to end on. You may be seated. So in one hour and 20 minutes, we have heard enough word to save, heal, sanctify, deliver, set free. You ought to act like you appreciate what God has deposited. Yeah. Woo! What made all of this possible? was a commitment of a God that still, in spite of us, loves us with an everlasting love. This part of the service where we receive together the Lord's Supper uh, is a culmination of appreciation. It, it is one of the most striking sacraments, experiences, that's why I said at the very beginning, we need to be a little bit more affected. Some of us have been in these kinds of services for decades. Do not allow the taint of this world to minimize your appreciation. For wherever you come together, he said, you do show my death until I come. He is clear about it. He is unmistakably accurate. It is the death of Jesus that Christians celebrate. It is the death of the Lamb that we honor. It is the commitment beyond measure that he was willing to give up for us. And so it's at that vein that we come this afternoon to the table. On Sunday, the Lord willing, we will have a different kind of service of resurrection and power. But I want us to be able to have the courage to linger a moment at the cross. At the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light, where the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight. Now I'm happy all the, at last and did my Savior bleed and did my sovereign die. That's, that's crazy. How, how would a, why would a sovereign die for a subject? And did my sovereign die? It's incredible. Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? At the cross. Linger there for a moment. Stand there for a minute. Stop being afraid. There's where salvation was purchased and bought in a way that 2,000 years later, I hope for you, will not grow old. Tonight, this afternoon, we're going to come to the table. And as we come, we come because of his insistence. What we must understand about this kind of service of the Lord's Supper, to those that love him, to those that appreciate him, he insists that we come. I say it often, not in a negative way, that I grew up in a church where we were afraid to come to a service like this. We avoided the table. Because we, we had this fear, we were almost taught that if we were not worthy and we came and partook of his broken body and shed blood, that we would become sick we would die 
I understand and I value our forebearers. They didn't have all of it. This participation at the table is critical. It is critical. We've heard that on Wednesday night when he was going to wash their feet and the lead apostle protested, said to him, you will never wash my feet. The Lord says to Peter, if I wash you not, you have no part in me. Just because you don't understand something does not mean you have the liberty to question it. Peter then, of course, gets crazy and goes, then wash my whole body. He said, no, Peter, I've already cleansed you. But living in this earth, your feet get dirty. And then he says, and what I have done to you, you need to do to one another. And so this table represents the highest reminder of sacrifice. I'm going to ask the ladies to come and the ministers to line up with me and come to the pulpit. Again, the question becomes, who should come to the table? Somebody said to me before, you let almost anybody come. You don't know the scripture. The scripture says, let a person examine themselves. Even the removal of the sheet is the unveiling of the body of Christ. He was, <laughs> I, I, I am getting ahead of myself for tonight. A part of what I want to share with them is a song. I may get to it. It says, living he loved me. Dying he saved me. Buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified. Oh, freed me forever. One day, he's coming back. Glorious day. The human mind is constructed to remember the great things, and we remember the evil things, but remember, you're not worthy, but you can come because he has made you worthy. Just don't come unworthily. Don't come as if you deserve to come. Don't come if you have not forgiven others. Don't come if you're not willing to let go of your grudges. Then don't come. You come because you commit to his life. And so it is our effort today to come together. And that's why people say, why do you make us all wait? Because you need to wait on one another. And so as we beckon you to come, I ask you to come and wait when you go back to your table with the elements, if you can, and we run to partake together. I'm going to ask, uh, I know there's some in, in the back where there's their gaps, if you will have the courage to come and fill up these seats over here and in this section, if you, if you will, don't, don't be scared, we won't hurt you, but come in and fill in some of those seats if you will. Um, again, our, our effort is to make sure that everyone has been served before we partake. When you come to the table, uh, there will be ushers and, and trustees in the aisle I'm going to ask you at this time to give your offering in as well. Give the Lord praise for that, the offering time. Yeah. When you come, you'll be asked again to give your offering. You'll come to the, to the table and you'll be served. And we will take our time to make sure that everyone who wants to come is able to come and partake together in the name of the Lord. Don't insist, ushers, if they're in the back and there's no room there, they're okay where they are. It's fine. Thank you. Praise the Lord.
broken body and shed blood, natural human elements, but by faith we receive the virtue of your life as we together partake. Bless each one that will come. Bless those that could not be here, but they're here virtually and they're sharing with us in the spirit of this redemption. Bless the hands that will receive it and the hearts to be renewed. Bring healing, bring strength, bring virtue. Most of all, get glory in Jesus' name. Amen. share in this in Jesus name amen please come it's low.
you've been served. Hallelujah. Boko, glory, bless you, bless you. Good to see you. My God, you're great and you are greatly to be praised. The aroma should encourage you. The smell should bless you. Me. It is more than songs we sing. Much more than an emblem on your chain. Say it. But it means <laughs> I'm free, yeah. From the chains of slavery. My Lord. And the blood of the shed won't let my sins remain.
in the order of the service that speaks to appreciation. The Corinthian church came in a hurry. They rushed the table. They did not wait on their brothers and sisters. The sacraments teach us the smell and the aroma of the wine should remind you of what he said. He said to the disciples, with a great desire have I desired to eat this bread and drink this wine with you. And then he made them a prophetic utterance that has not yet been fulfilled. I will not eat this bread again nor drink this wine till I drink it new with you, new with you in my Father's kingdom. It's to encourage those of us who understand our mission now is to build the kingdom. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And so we take our time and we reflect what we are about to do. As you take the bread and hold it, on the night in which he was betrayed, the Lord took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and then he gave it. The bread is the heart and body of Christ that is broken and given after being blessed. So are we, the body of Christ. He will bless us, life will break us, and then we can be given. Take this body, it is the body of Christ, Eat ye all of it in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We appreciate you. We appreciate you. We appreciate you. We appreciate you. Hallelujah. As he took the cup, he said, this is the New Testament. It is the covenant. It is my blood shed for the remission of sin. Drink ye all of it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 Give him praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give him high praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Woo.
you want Christ in your life, you need to be born again. You want to be born again, baptized, and filled with the Holy Spirit. Whatever the lack is in your life, the altar is open. I love that song. Yeah, give the Lord praise. Give the Lord great praise. Redemption is available. The power of God is real. Though your sins may be, give the Lord praise. Be as scarlet, he will wash them whiter than snow. Give God praise. For the Lord God Almighty reigns. Give God praise for them. Come on, make some noise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My Lord and God. Come, come, whoever you are. For the Lord God Almighty reigns. Everybody say. Rejoicing of heaven, give God praise. Hallelujah. For the Lord God Almighty the Lord reigns. God Almighty He's in charge. Reigns. Yes, He is. He reigns on high. Hallelujah. Lord, we love your name. Hallelujah. Give God praise. Give God high praise. For the Lord, the Lord God, God Almighty. God That's right. Call that number on the street. Call it now. We're waiting on you. His power is unlimited. His love will batch his power. Before you leave this place today, if you're here in physical presence or you're online, either one will work. He's where you are. He is waiting on you. Give God one more praise. Give him praise. He's waiting on you. He has gone to the tomb but he will get up in three days. Give him praise right now, yeah. Yeah, he, yeah, oh yeah, guarantee, guarantee. There's, yeah, there's still time, give God praise. Let somebody lay hands on you and believe God with you and walk the walk with you. That's what it's really all about, is sharing together in faith. Is my brother and my sister walking with me. Is believing God for each other holding fast to the unchanged love of God. Hallelujah. Give God praise for young people coming to Christ. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're Worship. Here I am I come to bow down. 
stand together the power and love of God is the only remedy for this earth and the Lord in his wisdom has decided to use human vessels somebody said God's gonna do it yeah through you God, God is not coming down to do this work the Lord is not coming down to do this work that's why we are here we are here to do the work that the Holy Spirit might be empowering us to lead souls to Christ. Listen, look forward to seeing you again, if so, tonight at Saints and Minas or uh, on Sunday. Come early, come prepared. I will tell you that uh, the multimedia ministry and others have been working tirelessly. I, how many enjoyed the praise dances and the things that they did? They were tremendous. Yeah, really. Yeah. The praise singers always prepared. All the things that have been put into, I will tell you, I've watched in the last two or three months as they've written, script, and practiced. Um, had them give me their script early so I could kind of prepare with them. Looking forward to resurrection, but I really did want you to spend some time. I'm a cross person. I'm a cross person. What will we do when the crosses are gone? Do not fool yourself. The enemy fears the cross. He fears the cross. He knows that the cross is the power of God. So don't be afraid to linger at the cross. Don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid of it. No cross, no crown. It is the cross we should emphasize. If you will touch and agree with somebody now as we close today, I hope the time will come we'll be able to touch and not be afraid. The prayer that I am honored to pray every time, it never gets old to me. But I pray the Lord for you in virtual land. The Lord bless you, keep you. The Lord make his face. Oh, God, we need your face. Make his face to shine upon you, your children, your children's children, your children's children's children. To the second and third and fourth generation, the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you genuine shalom wholeness, fullness of body, soul, and spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We love you. Glad you're here with us. Those again in virtual land. The Lord bless you.